Welcome everyone to City on a Hill. My name is Bruce. I'm the other guy on staff. Glad to have you here with us. Uh, it is our City Kids Sunday, but instead of going outside, we're going to do something different this morning uh, that is going to involve everybody, not just kids, not just families, but everybody is here this morning. So I'll explain that in just a few moments. As I was preparing this past week, I noticed something that I thought was sort of interesting, and the fact that all these 23s kept popping up on the screen or uh, on my laptop as I'm thinking, this is the year 23, right? 2023, 20, okay? Uh, today's date just happens to be the 23rd, and if you're keeping track, this is the 23rd message in our series of the book of Joshua. I thought that was sort of interesting. And that got me thinking about the number 23 and some other significant things about the number 23. And it just happens that the greatest player of all time in the NBA of all time, bar none, I don't care who you are, what your opinion is, the greatest player, maybe somebody can help me with this. S Steve, I, I see you. Who, who might that be? Yes, there he is, 23. Now, that has nothing to do with the sermon. But as I thought about 23, I thought of Michael Jordan. And when I think of Michael Jordan, I think of Steve Kroll. And if that, seem, if that seems odd to you, you'll just have to talk to Steve after the service because we agree that he's the GOAT, right? There is no, you know, I don't care, LeBron, I don't care who you like right now. They all fade in comparison. Am I right? Yeah. And that was really about the only time that NBA was actually fun to watch. Okay? The 90s, when the 90s were over, you might as well move on to lacrosse. I don't know. <laughs> Something else. Uh, ultimate Frisbee. That's a thing, right? That's a pro thing, right? Anyway, so we're going to move on quickly from that. But, uh, oh, something else to notice, not just the number 23, Maybe you've already noticed, perhaps not, but let me draw your attention to three different tables that are up front this morning, if you haven't seen them yet. They are here this morning. It's out of the ordinary, but they're here for all of us as a way for all of us to participate in what is going on this morning. So there's an eight-foot table on either side. It has a number of stones on it and some Sharpie pens. And you also see this round table in the middle and I'll explain what that, what's framed there. I'll explain that as we move along into the message. But really, this Sunday is a participatory Sunday for all of us to be involved in. The last two weeks, we've been talking about making choices. In the book of Joshua, I uh, highlighted a couple of major choices. There are a lot of them that Joshua and the people of Israel had to make and, and other people uh, and the book is filled with them. Two of them we have already talked about. Number one, when do you rest? A choice not just for Joshua, but for us today. Do you rest in Christ? Do you find rest even when the times around you are restless? Is there a way and a place and a time uh, that you can find rest in Christ? The book of Hebrews, we looked at that, and the answer is yes. But there is a choice involved for all of us to consider making. Do we return to Christ to find rest? Number two, where will you worship? We uh, looked at Joshua, the location of the tabernacle, the place, the presence of the Lord, how that determined where the people were to worship. Now, place doesn't matter to believers today unless we're talking about, in a spiritual sense, where are you at when it comes to worship? And it really boils down to, is Jesus the focus? Is he the goal? Uh, he is, the, is he the object of your worship? Or is it something else? Or is something else beginning to sneak in and begin to, to push Jesus more and more to the side? That's something that we talked about. Now, there's one more choice. That is this morning. And we're going to look at that as we look at uh, passage, passages from chapter 23 and chapter 24. But before Joshua gives the last choice for Israel to consider in chapter 24. Israel needs to spend some time remembering. Now, another thing that's different about this morning is a half-sheet handout. Maybe you've already seen it. Maybe you sat on it. Maybe you've already thrown it away. I hope you didn't do that. If you haven't thrown it away yet, please grab it. So the, 
the front side has Joshua, Jesus saves, Yeshua, Joshua, that's his name, that's Jesus' name as well. So you see Joshua, uh, the Lord saves, and then underneath that, that's where we're at. So if you're into writing on blanks, and this is your Sunday, grab a pen. You can feel a little more, <laughs> yes, a little more fulfilled this morning because you get to write something on a piece of paper. Now, that's important. And it's important for Israel, it's important for us, for, to, for us to consider this morning the time and the place that is necessary to think, to reflect, to remember. And Joshua, at the end of his life, in chapter 23, as he gathers the people and the leaders together, he takes them back in time. He restates the calling all the way back to chapter 1 that was first given to him. And then as he restates the calling, he brings everyone up to speed. Because at this point, it's been a few years since that initial calling that God put on Joshua as they entered the promised land, as they crossed over the river Jordan. It's been a few years of the conquest and the disposing of the, uh, the, the Amorites and the Canaanites and all those other ites so that Israel could, then to, uh, Israel could then occupy the land that the Lord had given them. It's been a few years. So it's important, as we've noticed throughout Joshua, to take time to remember what it is that the Lord is doing. If we don't take time to remember, we forget. So he reminds them of what God has done for them over the generations. All the way back to chapter 23, verse 14, Joshua, as he's reminding the people what the Lord has done, points this out. He says, all that the Lord has promised has come to pass for you. Not one of them has failed. Stop and think, he says to Israel. All the things the Lord has promised. Has he failed in giving one of them? And the answer is a resounding no. And that shouldn't be a surprise. That's the Lord doing what he's always done. The Lord has never failed on any of the promises that he's given to his people. And that's the point, really, of the, the beginning of chapter 24 and four, well, chapter 23 and into chapter 24. The Lord brought Abraham out of Ur and through this land of Canaan, chapter 24, verse 3. The Lord brought you out of Egypt, 24, verse 6. The Lord brought you to a land of Amorites east of the Jordan before you crossed over, 24, verse 8. The Lord brought or delivered you from Balak, uh, chapter 24, verse 9. And finally, the Lord brought you into the promised land and gave it to you. Chapter 24, verse 11. Israel needed to be reminded of God's repeated, unfailing faithfulness as they renew or recommit themselves to the covenant, the sacred promise that has already been there. But because they need to remember and renew and recommit, they've got to spend this time thinking reflecting on what it is that the Lord has done. Again, why is this so important? What have I already said? They prone to what? Forget. And not just Israel, we forget. You know, maybe for you, you think about, well, yeah, I forget the, the grocery list. I got to make a note of it. I forget to put gas in the car, run out of gas. There's, there's minor forgettings, right? But Joshua draws our attention to the major forgettings, those things that we dare not forget. So why does this matter to us today? It matters significantly in our lives today. Before, and here's why. Before you try and go forward, you should always stop and take a look back. Now, for us today, before we get caught up in looking forward, what's on my agenda right now? Or even this, what is it in this sermon that applies to me quickly, readily? What can I take? What can I grab from the pastor or from my devotional time or from the reading that I can insert rapidly into my life and gather something from? Before you rush ahead, 
to grab some little tidbit or some moral or some idea. Stop and think. What is it that got you here in the first place? Consider, remember the goodness of the gospel at work in your life. How has God provided for you? How has he blessed you? Count your blessings, name them one by one. You know that song? You ever heard of that? It's true that we need to do that. Consider what it is that the Lord is doing. Remember what you came from. <laughs> Remember how the Lord has worked in your life in, on your journey along the way. How has the Lord provided for you? How has he blessed you? What has he forgiven you of? And how many times has he done that? How often do we stop and consider, as we look back, the richness and the depth and the goodness of God? Now, perhaps you're at a place this morning where you've never done that. And perhaps you're still wondering or considering who God is in the first place. Let me suggest this. The fact that you're here, the fact that you're watching, streaming, the fact that you're listening is a blessing. The Lord is at work even now. Now, regardless of what your past is, regardless of what you brought into this moment right now, the Lord is not surprised by your past. He's not confused or frustrated by your choices. Uh, he's not surprised by anything because he's the Lord. And he has, in his timing, considered all things. In fact, he's planned them all out. Perhaps you're at a place right now that you don't know where the Lord has been at work in your life in the past, but I'm telling you, he has, and he's brought you to this moment now to reconsider what in the world he's up to in your life now. That's important, and it covers all of us here this morning. Don't forget, don't take for granted, don't be tempted to forget or miss out on the fact that without Jesus, hope is gone. So again, we're not talking about the blessings that come and go, the material things that we consider blessings. I was thinking about that again this morning. Uh, the, the things that we take for granted every day. I go to my, my sink and I, I just turn a, a, a lever and water magically comes out, right? How often do I take time and say, thank you, God, for water that comes out of my faucet, right? Right? I'm paying my bills. I, I'm not worried about my utility bills right now. Things function in my city. I'm so glad for that, right? How many people, a friend of mine is in, with his wife in Uganda right now. Uh, he's part of another ministry effort, and uh, I won't get into the details of all, of all he does, uh, but every time he goes, he and his wife go, it's always a reminder of, wow, what what. What, as they work with pastors, ministry leaders, as they engage in, in worship services and they work alongside other people, all the things that they, and they're from Iowa, right? And still, all the things that they have, they take for granted when you go to a place like Uganda. We are so richly, outrageously blessed. And that's nothing compared to the love of God for you. God, who does not have to love you, but he chooses to. And to take you as you are and bring you into his family where there is never a worry again of judgment or condemnation. It's gone because Jesus took it for you. Wow! Do you allow yourself to once again have your mind blown by the love of God that is poured out on you so richly and wonderfully? Who can understand it? What does Paul say? The the length, the, the width, the breadth, the depth of the love of God that surpasses knowledge? It surpasses knowledge. The love of God for you, for me, of all people. Remember how he loves you. Don't you ever dare get tired of that idea or that fact because it changes us as we keep it fresh. The people of Israel had to be recommitted, reminded, renewed in their covenant relationship and so do we 
So all this remembering leads us to the final address, the renewal of the covenant between Israel and the Lord. And that brings us to Joshua 24, verses 14 through 15. Now, therefore, Joshua says, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and faithfulness. Put away the gods that your fathers served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. And if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your fathers served in the, in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Third and final choice we consider in our series through the book of Joshua, who do you serve? Now, Joshua gives that choice to the people of Israel after reminding them of all the Lord has done. The people of Israel give a quick yes. And then Joshua throws it right back in their face with a no. <laughs> Are you kidding me? You're going to fail. You're not really going to choose the Lord. The Lord knows what's coming. And it's a wake-up call to the people from Joshua to take very seriously in a very solemn response what it is that this choice means for you. You don't throw out flippantly, oh, sure, I'll follow you, I'll choose you. No, you're not. You're not going to do that. He throws it right back in their face. The choice is not an easy one to make, and we do not dare make it casually before a living God. But the people persist, and they in insist that they will serve the Lord. So Joshua responds, chapter 24, beginning of verse 23, Joshua said, then put away the foreign gods that are among you. You notice he said that twice? This whole time, he knows, i got to stop here, okay? This whole time, the years of, of conquest and taking the land, there are still people in the camp of Israel who have seen the wonders again of God, and they still got little idols hidden somewhere. He, they must, because he keeps addressing it. Go back to your tent and grab that stupid, worthless piece of wood or clay or whatever it is and get rid of it. It cannot coexist with God. And then what? Incline your heart. Not just your actions, your heart to the Lord, the God of Israel. And the people said to Joshua, the Lord our God we will serve and his voice we will obey. So Joshua made a covenant with the people that day and put in place statutes and rules for them at Shechem, and Joshua wrote these words in the book of the law of God. And he took a large stone and set it up there under the terebinth that was by the sanctuary of the Lord. And Joshua said to all the people, Behold, this stone shall be a witness against us, for it has heard all the words of the Lord that he spoke to us. Therefore, it shall be a witness against you, lest you deal falsely with your God. So Joshua sent the people away, every man to his inheritance. These are the last recorded words of this man, Joshua, in this book. And the chapter ends with his death. The last words to the people. Look at how he addresses the people of Israel. Joshua makes it as clear as possible what this or what their choices are need to look like. Their choice to serve is immediate, he says. No messing around. Verse 15, choose this day. Don't walk away from this moment undecided. Choose this day. The choice to serve is black and white. It's the gods of your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, or the gods of the Amorites. There's no in-between ground. There's no middle place here. It's one or the other. The choice to serve is personal. You notice how he said in verse 15, but as for me and my house, we know what we're about. We're serving the Lord. So the implication then is, what about yours? What about yours? We know what we're doing. There is no doubt the direction we're in. We serve the Lord. What about you? The choice to serve is personal. As for me and my house, the choice is to serve is filled with consequences like I already mentioned, put away those foreign gods you keep messing with. The choice to serve is from the heart. 
Incline your heart, he says, to the people. There's so much at stake. And for any of this to matter past this moment, you must have a changed heart. Bind my wandering heart to thee, is the, the words from the song. I love that line. I love it. We need to pray that. Our hearts are constantly looking to make yet another God. It's one thing, a good thing, to go back to your tent and dig up that whatever it is in the sand to destroy it. But guess what? Moments later, a heart creates another one to replace that one. The only thing that ends that cycle is giving my heart over to the Lord repeatedly, ongoing, daily, moment by moment. Bind me to you. That's what Joshua is talking about. And then he goes on talk about the stone of witness and he sets it up to or next to the tabernacle and there's a reason for that okay he I, we don't know how big it is if he he's probably too old to set it up you probably got somebody to help him uh, but there it is sitting next right next to the tabernacle when you come back for the rites the sacrifices the worship that is associated with the temp, with the tabernacle every time you do that what do you see that stone that is a witness to the covenant we made with the Lord. You can, even if you're tempted to forget, or the next generation, or the children as they're growing up, what do they know about this? Every time you walk towards the tabernacle, Daddy, what's that rock about? And you tell them, we've made a covenant. And that rock, that stone there, stands as a witness. It heard us. Make that sacred agreement we cannot dare forget. And then you are ushered into worship at the tabernacle. That's the reason it's there, to agree and to worship from the heart. So using a stone as a witness is not a new thing in Joshua. How many times have we read the numerous times that the people use stones okay, to remind them or be reminded of the covenant choices? There are stones stacked beside the Jordan chapter 4. There's a stone altar in Mount Ebal, chapter 8. Remember that? We talked about that. And there was two different mountains. Choose. Choose. You know, we keep hearing this throughout the book of Joshua. 